But why do we need more powerful phones every year? It's the time of year for a little reflection, and I wanted to take a look at how far Android performance has come. 2023 was a fantastic year for high-performance phones, and we're starting to take a look at 2024 devices with even more compute power, even more graphics, tons more AI, 24 gigabytes of RAM. And I have to ask why. I worry that manufacturers are chasing stupid benchmark scores and putting pressure on companies like MediaTek and Qualcomm and even Apple to a degree to produce ever more powerful chips for our phones. But I don't really believe that's what consumers are always asking for. Pause this video right now and take a quick sampling of your family and friends and ask them, would you like 15% more compute power or would you like 20% more battery life? Get those answers, drop them in my comments. I don't think we're gonna be that surprised. A common refrain I hear is you need to overbuy the power of a phone when it's new if you want it to last for a long time as software becomes more and more demanding. And I'll have to save my rant on code efficiency for a later video or a two hour long podcast, but we can take a look back at an older phone and see how it compares to newer phones. Spoiler alert, the newer phones pretty much always win, but are those wins critical enough to convince you to buy a new phone. Now, I wanted to go a ways back, I and mean, even farther back than what we would consider reasonable for someone who would have really owned and used a phone as their main primary only phone daily driver. We're not talking the peak of the bell curve average for phone ownership, we're talking long tail phone ownership. Plus, it's just fun to dig an old LG out of retirement. My test device for this video is the venerable Korean LG V50 released in 2019. So we're going on four and a half years old from the time this video was shot and with four and a half year old specs that will be listed somewhere on your screen here. I'm not gonna read the specs off. If you want a deeper dive on what's inside here, you can hit up my friends over at GSM Arena. Oh, but this right here, one of my all time favorite devices, killer features ahead of its time in many ways, but it's still a product of 2019 era technology. Now I used to produce benchmarking videos and articles publicly, but no one really watched them. So I've largely been posting this data over on my Patreon, patreon.com slash some gadget guy. If you want access, I've been keeping up to date all of my charts and graphs and performance tests the folks over on my Patreon directly contributing and helping to support that kind of data as I really do work that into my videos and reviews. I retested the V50 here with current apps and updates, and here's how it stacks up against modern devices. Now we're gonna jump right into some real world tests. I mean, we can look at Geekbench or Antutu, but a number score on performance tells you very little about how a phone will really handle your apps and games. We would rightfully mock a computer or laptop reviewer who only showed you a Geekbench score in a minute of Genshin Impact gameplay and use that as any kind of purchasing recommendation on a CPU or a graphics card. Starting off with video editing, I use LumaFusion for my mobile projects. I have a test project, it's a minute long in 4K30, using clips from my mirrorless cameras with transitions, a watermark, and a soundtrack. I time the rendering at a 50 megabit per second bitrate. It's kind of a perfect scenario for folks who like making little YouTube or family videos or shorts or TikToks. The V50 took one minute and one second to render and save the video, which means it finished a basic video project in roughly real time. The fastest phone of 2023 I've recorded in this test is able to complete the exact same project in 29 seconds. Now this is a critical test for me because I really do enjoy editing from my phone out in the field. And I often shoot from my phone camera. So it saves a lot of time editing inside the camera I shot the footage from. This is an example of an area where I personally I'm happy to spend a lot more to get higher performance on a phone if it means I can leave my laptop and my cameras at home to get my work done. But I also want to put this test in perspective. Let's say you had a cute little laptop or a mini PC with an 11th gen Intel Core i7 and you were a nerd like me and painstakingly recreated the same project frame by frame with the same transitions, the same watermark, and the same soundtrack in the free version of DaVinci Resolve, and you rendered that project on this 
proper computer. I wonder what the result would be. Well, wonder no more. I actually ran that test on the mini PC I'm talking about in my review, and the Intel machine finished this one minute project in one minute and 40 seconds. I know, it's not a totally fair oranges to oranges comparison, and DaVinci Resolve can do so much more than LumaFusion, but the practical output of getting to a little YouTube video finished, rendered, and uploaded, the workflow is just faster on a four and a half year old phone. On the opposite side of the spectrum, I can also feel some folks itching to talk about the average consumers who don't do things like edit the TikToks or slap watermarks on their videos. So what about a simple video trim, taking a longer video clip and making it shorter? Google recently spruced up Google Photos, and it's a lot faster now at cutting a piece of video. I take a three minute video clip and I turn it into a two minute video clip, and the LG V50 finished in 54 seconds. It was half the time in processing as the clip would play out in real time. Now the fastest phone of 2023 in this test finished the same task in 25 seconds. I want that power. I want that performance. But I'm not entirely sure my aunts and uncles would fully appreciate those differences unless they had two phones side by side to watch the test play out. You know, like how all those average consumers are always walking around benchmarking their phones. Moving on, I'm getting really snarky in this video. The V50 is still one of my all time favorite audio devices, not just for listening to music, quad DAC, but also for recording. Mixing down a one hour podcast, two tracks of wave audio with music and ads and bumpers, and compressing that down into a smaller MP3 file. The V50 finished a podcast mix down in two minutes flat. The fastest phone in this test in 2023 hit one minute and two seconds. So yes, we see a substantial improvement, but if you don't think it's impressive that a phone from almost five years ago can mix an hour long podcast down in two minutes, then I think you're kind of bad at tech. So now, moving on again, hitting the phones with more heat and throttling, running a longer RAR compression test, taking a folder with three gigabytes of files, squishing it down using best compression. The V50 was relatively pokey. It took 19 minutes for it to squish that folder down. The fastest phone of 2023 in this test was a Screamer, finishing in seven and a half minutes. And for all you PC nerds, things like file compression, that's an area where our Windows computers, our proper computers, dramatically outpace our little ARM chips. Congratulations, you did it. Make all those tasty RAR files knowing you're doing that faster than a four and a half year old phone. But that's also kind of a good point. File compression is tough for phones. It's an app MediaTek really struggles with, and the newest Dimensity chip was only 40 seconds faster than the V50 in this test. The OnePlus Open, monster performer, easily one of my favorite phones of the year, but it delivered a relatively slow time. And also Google's newest Tensor 3, not that much faster. It's kind of a wild test to compare where the software, hardware, and app optimization really matters from phone to phone to phone, and results don't always scale yearly like we think they should. That's one of the reasons why I get so frustrated with Geekbench and Antutu score reviewers. If you lean on your phone for document work, this kind of file management might make your life a lot easier when you're out and about. And if you buy the phone with the biggest N22 score, you might get a phone that performs terribly for your specific needs. My last test, the silliest test I run where I really want to task a phone and get it to thermal throttle. I batch process 200 RAW files from a Sony a7 III, and I time the difference between the first 100 photos and the second 100 photos. This is the least practical test that I run, the least realistic, but I also want to show areas where people can do a lot more work out in the field before they feel they should turn to a laptop. A photojournalist, maybe covering hotspot kind of news around the world, might want to transfer over from a proper camera to their phone, batch edit a bunch of photos in Photomate, Lightroom, or even XN Convert, and upload them directly over the phone's data connection. But if a phone handles 200 images, raw files well, we can be confident that it could also handle smaller batches of photos well too. And this test became more important for me because it also highlights the manufacturers that are prior prioritizing a quick burst of activity for a higher Geekbench score against the phone makers that build products that perform more consistently over longer tasks. But this one is really silly. It took the V50 
24 minutes to apply filters and save all those JPEGs. The fastest phone of 2023 in this test finished in 14 minutes. But I also want to highlight that the V50 barely slowed down. There was only a 3% difference between the two batches. The Xiaomi 13 Ultra finished the first batch ludicrously fast and then got hit with a whopping 26% slowdown for the second batch of files. The V50 is a lot slower, but it's also a lot steadier. You can kind of count on its highest tier of performance just kind of hanging with you until the battery is fully degraded. For phone enthusiasts and more hardcore mobile professionals, I think this is information that should help contribute to a purchasing decision. What apps do you use and how long do you engage with those apps to complete tasks? Now, just a couple notes on gaming. I won't harp on this too much. I don't really run a lot of in-depth tests here, but the V50 is still a solid option for gaming. If you really hammer it with the highest quality settings in Genshin or in emulators, it's gonna show its age pretty quick, but I can get comparable and sometimes better frame rates in games like Alien Isolation over a newer Pixel 8 Pro. It's still a wonderful option for indie games and platformers. Dead Cells runs great. A lot of twin stick shooters, Vampire Survivors, Shredder's Revenge. They're all totally capable and fun experiences, which is why you want to listen to reviewers who test more broadly than just looking at GPU synthetic scores and looking at a single game for a test. Whew. All right. Wrapping this all up, if you bought an LG V50 or a Galaxy S10 or a OnePlus 7 or any other premium tier phone from 2019, you still have a fantastic, practical pocket computer. I'm happy I've upgraded over the years because I legitimately am trying to do more and more compute work out of my phones. And I'm always happy when I can get my work done without having to pack a laptop and a mirrorless camera. But if you're not leaning on a phone that hard, there's very little in the way of modern software that would really be slowing you down. This thing is still plenty capable with most of the modern apps and services we use today. App developers are not trying to make their apps only for the top 5% of the most premium phone purchasers. They want their apps to run well on mid-rangers and entry-level devices too, where an almost five-year-old phone, a five-year-old premium phone is still more powerful than all of the entry-level phones and many of the mid-rangers that are being sold today. The main issues we see have very little to do with the chip inside for performance, but more your battery. If you had really used only this phone over four and a half years, your battery would have degraded a lot. And that's what's really gonna slow your phone down. If we had better expectations on longer term support and security patches, the idea of just popping out the battery and putting in a fresh battery, I think that would be attractive to a lot of people, especially considering all of the other things that we've kind of lost along the way. Have a lot of fun picking up the LG V50 for all of the additional features like really premium audio file grade audio and the ability to pop in a micro SD card to dump a ton of storage in here, alongside the fun experiments like having a dual display phone in a case that folds up still quite a bit smaller than a lot of our other folding phones. And I'd also like to point out that I ran these tests with one old phone as the main focus of this video, but notice how there was no clear winner in the modern phones I compared it against. Every phone this year had distinct pros and cons, and some phones performed better in some tasks and poorer in others. So if you're watching a reviewer and they're highlighting an Antutu or a Geekbench score, it's telling you very little about the specific strengths and weaknesses of the device. And those scores can often lead you to the wrong solution for your specific needs. So whenever I make videos like this, I always wanna hear down in the comments, who do you watch or read articles from that does a good job of covering performance beyond a synthetic benchmark score. There's a lot we do on our phones these days. We should pay attention to which phones really perform specific tasks better. So please share their site or their channel name down below and help promote people doing better review work. I hope to someday build up a little community of mobile testers that would more closely resemble the work done by channels like Hardware Unboxed or Gamers Nexus. But we techies can't do that when the vast majority of phone reviews are really just super late. If the enthusiasts can't turn out and support better data, we'll never get the message across 
to other consumers. So drop those comments down below, maybe smash a bell icon on your way down. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel. All the support lately has been amazing. Those of you checking out my home site, somegadgetguy.com, clicking on links in my video and article descriptions, or if you're joining the list of names, scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, that's patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the universe, and they currently are the only place, uh, they're the only geeks getting exclusive access to a lot of this benchmarking data as I'm going and putting together my public video reviews. They're basically the coolest people in the universe, so I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet, at some gadget guy, basically everywhere, but these days I'm spending a bit more of my time on the Mastodons, a little less so on the Facebooks and the Instagrams, and definitely not on the Twitters, and I will catch you all on the next video.